Recording in progress. And Representative Ansel is here to talk with us about the legislative process. And then there's no decision that will be made tonight. This is just informational. So it looks like we have a pretty good turnout. Those on the screen, everybody on Zoom able to hear and see if they want to? Okay. All right, so let's start it off with Jeremy going into his presentation that he worked on. Okay. So it looks like we're recording, everything's going. So um, if you don't know me, I am, my name is Jeremy Weiss. I am the town clerk here. Um, thank you for coming in person. Thank you for coming on Zoom. Um, I think everybody's muted. If you're not muted, just make sure you mute yourself. Um, and as we all know, the acoustics in this room are really challenging. So as much as we can keep jostling and stuff to a minimum, that will help everybody online be able to hear. Jocelyn's here? Jocelyn. <laughs> so um, I wanted to thank all the boards of, all, all the members of the Board of Civil Authority for coming. Um, this is my first time doing this kind of thing for a long time, so I appreciate <laughs> um, being able to be here and provide some information and then um, looking forward to hearing from Janet um, and just going from there. Um, We'll do, for everybody uh, on Zoom, we'll do questions right after. I'm gonna do a little PowerPoint and then we'll, we can just start in with, we'll have Janet and um, speak and then we can just do question and answer and we can have public comment and the, you know, it's our meeting so we can, you know, go as we will. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna share screen. Okay, so let's do this. Um, okay, so I, as you know, um, the there's been a proposal um, by the legislative apportionment board to um, put us in a new district. This this is about as small as the printouts are. But it's, uh, the proposal is to put us in a district with Worcester and Woodbury and a small section of East Montpelier along Route 14. So uh, just quickly, why reapportion? Kind of comes back to the one time, one vote rule. The um, legislature originally in Vermont was a unicameral body. There was one member for every town. There was 246 members. It was wild. The pictures of all those members in there, their spittoons, they're in there smoking cigarettes, they got like shawls on. It's crazy. Um, it must have been, I can't even imagine, and there were so many different um, committees and things. Um, but this created a lot of inequity as people were moving into Vermont and people were moving around in Vermont. Um, the classic example is the town of Stratton that had 38 residents, one representative. City of Burlington, 35,000 plus re residents, one member. So you could, house uh, majority could be achieved by towns holding only 9% of the population. So that was problematic. Um, there was some Supreme Court uh, cases. Um, this is not Supreme Court, but I'm saying this, there were Supreme Court cases. Um, Baker v. Carr, which looked at whether redistricting was a political question in the courts. Um, found that it wasn't, meaning the courts could be involved. This is from Vermont District Court in 64 that held that the House was grossly malapportioned and the Senate was essentially the same. Um, and that led to the court ordering uh, the Vermont General Assembly to reapportion. Um, at that point, they went from 246 members down to 150 members, uh, based on population as opposed to total voters. That year there was a special election. Everybody had um, a one-year term and then the Bionians started up the following year in 1966. And um, the Legislative Apportionment Board was created at that time. Um, so in 74, all of those changes were ratified in the Vermont Constitution. Um, and 
they basically said, among other things, that the Legislative Apportionment Board would have an advisory capacity. They could submit proposals to the General Assembly, and the General Assembly could essentially do whatever they want with that. Um, this was from a memorandum from Tom Little, who's the chair or the special master of the board. Katie, um, you should admit John. <laughs> there we go. Um, they basically are looking at the new population of Vermont, which is 643,000, oh, there's a typo, 50, zero, um, 500. And you divide that by 150 seats, and the magic number is 4,287. That is the ideal um, population of the district, of any district. And if it's a two-member district, then you just double that. These are some deviation calculations. It's just kind of looking at um, the percentage um, negative or positive. Um, so for instance, uh, our map currently the, the, pro the proposed map um, has a population of 3,957 3, residents, um, which is a deviation of 330 residents according to what that ideal uh, population is of over 643,000. So for our new district, uh, uh, the negative actually has a negative deviation of 7.7, .7, which means we actually theoretically have a little bit more power than we did last time around. Um, beyond uh, the overall deviation, the board, the legislative um, apportionment board is guided by three statutory directives, which are important for us because these are the same um, directives that the Calis, BCA, and all the BCAs in Vermont can use to justify redrawing the lines and making their own proposal. And that's the preservation of existing political subdivision lines, patterns of geography, social interaction, political ties, use of compact and contiguous territory, all of which I'm not sure anyone actually knows what that means. But that being said, we can, you know, the, the BCAs are better situated to know what their towns look like, and so that's, you know, um, and they have the authority over the elections. So in terms of the BCA and next steps, the Legislative Apportionment Board has prepared and sent out their statewide proposal. All the towns have been notified. We can recommend, um, based on the standards that I just outlined, which are the preservation of existing political subdivisions and all of those things. Um, we have till November 15th, and then the lab, the, we'll consider the recommendations from towns, they'll make a final proposal, um, and then that will get forwarded to the clerk of the house, and, the ho and then they will send it to committee. Um, Do you know how often they listen to the towns that provide comment? I don't. Okay. I don't know how often they listen, and I don't know how often or how thoroughly the legislature listens yeah. to their plans, so I'm not sure. I, mean, we'll, I think Janet probably knows a lot okay. more about that than myself, but I think um, they try to listen and they're statutorily obligated to consider, which of course we know doesn't mean that they have to do any of that. Right. So our district, Callis District, has um, changed over time. So we were a one-member voting district um, forever, yeah. until 1965, and then we were placed into District 60, uh, which was Calais, East Montpelier, Woodbury, in 73, or after the redistrict in the 1970s, um, we were placed in Washington 2, which was Calais, Cabot, and Marshfield. Um, Redistricting in 1981 resulted in being placed in Washington 1, Callis, Middlesex, Worcester. Um, and then in 91, that was when we were in a two member district with Callis, East Montpelier, Marshfield, Plainfield, and Woodbury. When you say two member, you mean two representatives? So two representatives, correct. Um, and then Could that. Double the population. Yeah, so that would be, yeah, it would be. Right. I'm not sure what it was at that time, but for us it would yeah. be over 8,000 yeah. yeah. people. Okay. Um, and then uh, in 2001, we were placed back into Washington 6, so that's Calais, Marshall, Plainfield, and that's our current district. It did not change in 2012. 
So we've been in Washington six since the um, beginning of the 2000s. Um, and then just getting into who has represented us since about that time. Um, 1965 was Blatchley, and then, you know, we had, most notably, Eva um, was, a, was our member for, first for District 60, and then Washington 2 from 71 to 80. Um, and also importantly, um, we had, so, Elena Fano and Donny Osmond were our members um, when we were a part of that two-member district. Um, Heather Schuldice was appointed by Jim Douglas mm -hmm. um, because uh, Tom yeah. Pelham resigned. Right. Um, so she was in, she was from Callis, she was appointed and was in for a year, and then Janet ran and prevailed and has been our representative ever since. Right. Um, and then, so there's the very small map. And I guess this is kind of the end of my presentation, but the two things that I felt like would be helpful to think about is just generally how does the BCA feel about the proposal to move to one member district statewide. So that's a really big part of their proposal, which is to break up every single district, every single two member district in the state and turn it. So there's a lot of chatter about that. People are happy, unhappy, all what sorts of- that, What were the positives associated with having one member district? Uh, um, I think part of the- state. I don't know, I think it's the idea of just more representative democracy because it's a smaller portion of the population. Um, there was, and, and that's, we can kind of get into that. Um, there was other, there's other proposals that went around and the one that prevailed um, it was uh, on a vote of four to three. So it wasn't exactly a unanimous decision to propose un one district voting blocks across the entire state. The other notable thing, which we won't concern ourselves with, is the law that was passed last year that um, requires three member Senate districts. So that, of course, affects Chittenden County, does not affect us. Um, and, um, and also, so the districts are larger, if you will. If you have one member districts, it means that one person represents a larger population. No, no it's, a, it's an equal distribution. It's supposed you to be only have, have 150 members. 150 right. members of the house. Right. 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 They you still are going to, so it either be representing 4,000. It's whatever is closest to this 4,287. Your math is upside down, Mark. What? You got your math numerator and your denominator okay. flipped. <laughs> and one other notable thing is, is the Senate, and Janet can maybe speak to this, the Senate can change as well, but we don't have any, um, they don't give us an opportunity to weigh in on that. Like they do the representatives. Something, something I read. I, I think that's right. Yeah. Good. Because they're exclusive. Yeah. So with that, that's kind of the end of my piece. I think we'll um, invite Janet sure. to yeah. make some remarks if you want to sit or if you would, what's your preference? Yeah. Whatever is easy for okay. people to hear me. Um, so. Um, I was just look. I love that list of all the districts we. This is very low down. Um, of all the districts that we had, and the different legislators, and um, it's much higher. Slightly uh, better. I'm going to say that and sink away out of there. Um, uh, I've forgotten about Bill Blashley. Oh, of yes. course. Yeah. Um, My husband remembers when Bill Blashley was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've got some experience about how, how it works. 
One of the uh, things, uh, just to note, not making any judgment about it, the Legislative Apportionment Board, which is set up by the Constitution, is set up to have equal representation from every major party, which means that it has two Democrats, two Republicans, and two progressives. And that's not really reflective of the state as a whole um, or of the mm -hmm. legislature. How come it doesn't so, have independence? Uh, party. Not a party. Oh, they're not a, not a party. party. Okay. Um, that makes sense. So, and, the, and then a special master that's appointed by the uh, Supreme Court, who in this case is Tom Little, who's a, a Republican, although I don't know that you necessarily know that. But um, so it's, it's an interesting body to be making a recommendation on what's really a sort of a political plan when you consider that it's not actually representative of the way the state is uh, votes um, typically. Um, the, um, I guess the, 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 the way it has worked in the past is the legislature, um, I think, learns a great deal from the work that the apportionment board does. I think they do all the sort of uh, prep work, all the, the preliminary work. They do, they do the work also with the BCAs, um, but the legislature has never adopted their plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the, sometimes it varies substantially and sometimes not a lot. Um, the question about the single member districts is a pretty significant one. I, I went back and looked at the Constitution tonight just to remind myself before I came. The Constitution allows one and two member districts. It's very clear. Um, so the, the decision to say that we can only have single members is sort of an artificial um, constraint on the way the Constitution um, has set it up. It's legal to do that. We could do all single members. Um, but it, it also, it tends to run afoul of some of the other requirements that are in the Constitution, like the compact and contiguous mm -hmm. districts, mm -hmm. the community of interest, those kinds of things. So. You know, as, you're, as the board is, the legislative apportionment board is weighing this, and as the legislature weighs it, there are these competing um, goals. And you end up, um, I think one of the worst districts that was done last time is the one that includes Bolton and Huntington and yeah. uh, Waterbury. It's a terrible district. It runs over the mountain. Um, and we, kn we knew that when we did it, but it, when you, you're drawing a map with 150 members, you kind of get to a place in the middle where you, you've made all these other decisions and you're kind of stuck with the decision that you've got. So that, that's part of the process. Um, yeah, sorry. I just had a quick question. Remind me how often we do this. Is it every 10 term? years? 10 years. Every 10 years. Okay. Okay. Yep. When it's, yep. In accordance with the sentence. With, with the, the sentence. sentence. Yep. Yep. Okay. And, we, and one of the other issues um, that we have this year is a timing problem. Uh, we have COVID, but we, over and above, or separate from COVID, we had a census that was problematic yes. for a whole lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and happened late, took longer than it should have. There were issues around um, counting um, mm -hmm. undocumented people and so on. And so it got finished very late and the legislative apportionment board got the figures very late. What that's meant is that you all are being brought into the process late. Um, when it gets to the legislature, one of the things that um, probably matters more to people who are running than people who are watching, but um, the petitions, we have to file petitions by the end of May. Uh, anybody who wants to get on the ballot has to file by the end of May. So if we're adopting a plan that we really don't start working on until January. It has to go through the House, it has to go through a committee process, it has to go through the House, it has to go through the Senate, then it has to go to the governor for a signature. You can see that it might well be April or May. Yeah. It's very difficult for people to file in a district when they don't know what the boundary is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted, if you wanted to run from Dallas and you didn't know if you were gonna go to Marshfield, for signatures or go to Worcester for signatures. Yeah, right. yeah. Ours is pretty easy because our towns are all, we, we sort of have something in common with all these towns. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I don't, I don't think we're, yeah. I don't think it's as much of a disadvantage here as it might be in some parts of the state, but it will be a, a real time crunch mm -hmm. when we get there. So anyway, that's just kind of Wait, let's, let's, giving you a whole lot of <laughs> Let's, um, let's yeah. figure out how we're gonna do this about yeah. asking questions. I was thinking of letting the folks on Zoom go first to ask questions. Because are you done, Janet, or are you? I'm, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm not yet. Yet. yes, I'm happy to answer questions. So folks on Zoom, raise your hand with the little icon if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Nobody? Well, I think there are takes a minute. Okay. Well, if you think of it. Yeah, and it oh, the, Dylan? The hand raise function is under they got reactions. It. Yeah. And there'll be a choice of things you can click on at the very bottom. There's like a, a long line that says raise hand. And when you're done speaking, you gotta click on it again to unraise your hand. All right, put your hand down. Okay, Dylan. Uh, just a comment, I generally support this change. I think it looks good to me and more accurately reflects that kind of second criteria. Okay. Um, anybody else on Zoom? I don't see anybody else's Michael, hand up. Michael, Michael, what, Michael? Yeah. Michael Egden? Yes. You got to unmute. I'm trying, yep. I only have a, I had one comment from a person who, who thought the, the district should follow more of the school lines, like U32 instead of getting involved with Hazen or uh, another district. Uh, myself, I think that uh, we were in Woodbury before, worked pretty well. Uh, I've lived both in Woodbury and in Callis, and uh, it seems that the it'll be a very uh, uh, easy district to deal with. I don't know much about Worcester. I do think the print is not great for East Montpelier. I disagree with that, but uh, other than that, it's fine. Yeah, you make a good point about the U32 piece. Worcester is U32, but Woodbury is not. Correct. Yeah. But I don't see a problem with that. I think the people in Woodbury are generally uh, pretty much attuned to uh, our district. Right and now, I think they're in with uh, Morris, Billy, and Elmore, I believe, and they're not too happy about that. At least the people I spoke right. to Woodbury are Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks, Mike. Jamie. Anybody else? Jamie, Jamie yeah. did you have your hand up? Oh, she's Yeah, saying, sorry, yeah. I can't find the hand, just the thumbs up. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if it's <laughs> how common it is. It feels a little confusing to me to have part of a town in one district and part of a town in another. Yeah. Um, like where exactly the property lines, it just feels confusing to me. Is that common to have towns split between districts? I let Janet answer. Uh, no, it's not. And um, what, what, what's happened in the past is if they couldn't, if the numbers weren't right, um, they would create a two-member district and then the line uh, dividing those two members would be done by the boards of civil authority, not by the legislature. Hmm. And so, um, in this case, for example, it, it seems to me that if we took part of East Montpelier, it would make more sense to take part of AMAC right. rather than Route 14. But that would be something that people would understand locally better than um, at the apportionment board. But that's one, of the com that's one of the comments we could make that it, it aligns with our culture and mm -hmm. those other things Jeremy listed more to have the AMAC portion than the Route 14 portion, for instance. Yeah. 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 Hey, but, but it's not typical to divide them up. Anybody else on Zoom comment? All right. Audience, but Rick. Yeah, it is kind of a three-part question. Number one is, have you considered staggering to avoid the problem you talked about? Somebody in this reapportionment year not knowing <laughs> what district they're running for, have you considered staggering one year? It makes up for it at the end, you know, so that you would use the old districts, you read district essentially within the district it's now. Can you old. speak up? Okay, Thanks. yeah, I'm, I'm just take, asking take Janet. Take your, yeah. your mask off and speak to the speaker. If, if I'm talking about the, uh, if staggering by one year, 
the redistricting, so that you actually do the redistricting, but you retain the old district. So you don't confuse people running in that year about what district am I running for when we read this. And then it kind of made up for that at the end of that 10 year period. This, the second part of the question was, did that, you know, were, did there, is the modeling done kind of similar to the way that they do the regional planning commissions based on these, you know, economic and social bundles of communities that kind of work together and live together, not, and then related to that is the Huntington, the example you gave, the Huntington Bolton, you know, connection that's really clumsy. Do you rotate that in the next, so that they don't get stuck with a bad district? Okay. You make sure they don't get, you know, so that in perpetuity, you know, and this is, this kind of goes along with that districting, like, say the RPCs are set up there, those economic social centers rather than county boundaries or, you know, and that's, to me, that, that would be a basic framework. So, so to answer the first question, I'm not sure that we can do that um, yeah, under yeah. the Constitution. I, I have a feeling that, that when you when you get to it, there probably would be some issues with that because mm -hmm. things would be so out of joint for a period of time. Um, the other issue about you know sort of these communities of interest, you know, roads, school districts. There are a lot of things that you might where people shop, where they have jobs that you might look at to make that decision. And um, there, there are places, I agree about Huntington and, and Bolton, I think, I think they're due for uh, a district that makes more sense to them, um, that we can't, we can't guarantee that that'll happen, but um, I agree that they've had long enough um, in a difficult district. I think we've been lucky, I think all those districts that we've looked at there, I think make some sense for us. Um, I think the one we have makes sense. I think the one that's being proposed makes sense. Um, so I think we, but we're sort of in an easy place in some ways. Do you know why, oh, I'll, wait. I'll wait to ask my question. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I do, I, I mean, this is maybe not uh, germane to raise here. Uh, I'm concerned that if some of the Woodbury folks aren't gonna wanna be in this district particularly those folks that are out on Woodbury Road, Cape Brook Road, Buffalo Mountain, because all of their orientation is towards Hardwick Elmore. And, and Elmore mm -hmm. and Wolcott. Yeah. And so if it were to be split off, then maybe we could get part of that East Montpelier that's associated with Adamant to come up with a better yeah, configuration exactly. for That's a great idea. So, and Marge, I'm sorry to ask this at this point, but I've been having a lot of trouble hearing between the mask, the room, and my ears. Um, what, uh, and I'm sure I've gone over this before, but the problem with a two-member district is what, is this purely a numerical exercise, or, I mean, Yes, it's cultural, but I mean, basically, is it trying to get just a, a direct correlation between numbers and and towns or districts or uh, <laughs> help? So, so the numbers drive all this. They, they, that's the starting place. So that's are the numbers, and then there are all these so other the, factors. So the ideal number was forty three hundred. I thought it was four thousand fifty nine, but you had some other figure, but. Uh, it's 4,000. I got that off the website. 4,287. Yeah. Okay. Like well, what, there, there is a non-number. I, 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 I thought I copied it off the website, but I had it wrong. There are so it's from, from Tom Little's okay. memo. It said 4,287. Okay. So, and I thought the Constitution allows two member districts. Why is it important to well, I'm not arguing for the single member district plan. important to you, <laughs> but 
um, what is the concept behind not having two member districts? I mean, are, is this solving a problem that's real or, a problem? or is it in search of a problem? Who proposes. Hmm? I have to ask the apportionment board. Okay. No, I, well, I guess I'm totally ignorant about any context and any history of this. This is just totally a new thing. So that's why I asked. They probably had their meetings on YouTube, right? So they're probably out there. The minutes recorded. are there. The minutes are all there. There's no video recording? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. there is. There is. I think there is. I so think. you could probably go back, Marge, and watch it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was a four to three vote. If you're really bored. So it's divided. It's very divided. Yeah. So, it's and are you wanted to shorter, more dark? Marge, are you done? Hmm? I can just say one thing about Marge's comment. Um, if you go to the Secretary of State and the reapportionment website, there are tons of materials. You will find supporting materials of all of the board members justifying the plans that they put together. So for the people who put together this plan, which ultimately prevailed at the board level, you will there's articles, there's all sorts of things that they have posted on there that give their argument as to why they think a one-member voting district is more pure and for all these different reasons that I don't really know, I don't quite understand, but I think you know part of it was they were making arguments about fairness and different things and so, but it's interesting and telling when you see how divided the vote was that it was a four to three, like that's... About that four to three, just so I understand the four to three. Was it four to three at the start as to whether they should pursue one member districts as a policy, or did two different factions produce two different reapportionments Correct. based on having a one member district or not? And there were essentially a real division as to the total apportionment plan. I think the four to three vote was on this particular plan. Yes, got it. And then I, I think there were probably a whole bunch of other uh, decisions, whether they came to votes or not. Sometimes things don't get voted, but they, you know, it's obvious that there's a division. So the legislature can, can tinker with this, right? The legislature oh, has sure. every other time just started over. Okay. It sounds like they're going to need to tinker with a 4-3 yeah. vote. Which doesn't mean that, this, that, that we shouldn't be focusing on this particular proposal for us. Um, yeah because that may survive, um, yeah. whatever, whatever the changes are. Okay, Art wanted to comment. Um, well, in some states, uh, reapportionment, legislative reapportionment uh, every 10 years is a nefarious way to yeah. unbalance votes, et cetera, et cetera. So the question I have is, politically speaking here, Janet, uh, would this skewer uh, the vote in any particular way. In other words, by adding one area that might have a lot more Republicans than another area, and therefore make it harder to win the, the district, or will this not be an issue? I don't think the political makeup of this proposal is much different than what we have currently. Um, okay. But that's my, my I, I've only run and Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield, but I know the other towns a bit, and I don't, I don't think it's much different. Statewide, what's happened is that population is uh, grown in Chittenden County and Franklin County. Uh, Chittenden County tends to be Democratic. Franklin County tends to be Republican. Mm -hmm. um, and they've lost population in the Northeast Kingdom, which tends to be more conservative, and they've lost popular, we have lost population in the southern part of the state. So there are shifts statewide that probably, um, <coughs> you know, you could look at and uh, make a judgment about what the political impacts are. But right here, I don't think there's much change. Well, it, it sounds like, to answer our question, it sounds like having, whether you, you think it's not representative, having an equal membership yeah. from all three parties kind of prevents, should prevent, or should be a hedge against people gerrymandering to the point where they're doing spaghetti, spaghetti lot districts yeah. to accomplish an end. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a positive. Yeah. And we have, uh, frankly, we haven't really done that in the Yeah, yeah, but it prevents yeah. that. And I'm wondering, 
I guess Those the question I had would be, I wonder if they looked at, if you look at the population of East Montpelier and Callis, it gets you to about 42, 59. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that they didn't, I'm not saying that this is a good idea, but it's interesting that they didn't propose East Montpelier Callis mm -hmm. right. as a district. Right. Yeah, if you know. look at the numbers. Right. What is it doing? Does, does anyone have an idea of what the population of this little hunk is? I think it's about 400. Yeah. 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 And then there was a request, just so everybody in the room here knows, there was a request from folks on Zoom if we could try to identify ourselves because I think it's probably hard to know who's talking right. with a mask on. So yeah. just, just talking that out there. Well, and so for tonight, you know, this is all a really a, a great discussion. So the process next is for the BCA to meet and come to a, a decision on what it wants to propose. What we propose goes through a portal on a website. What members of the public can do is to file written comments. Correct? Correct. Yeah. And the question about does the board listen to the BCAs? Um, I think I think they do, and I think the legislature does, and mm -hmm. um, I I think um, does, that doesn't mean they'll necessarily accommodate everything. So I think you, it's important to comment. And can you say the process again? So this goes back to the reapportionment. Is it apportionment or reapportionment? It's, it's the legislative apportionment. 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 So yeah. this goes to them. Yeah. They do what they do. do, what they do. And then they make a proposal. Does it go to the House and the Senate, or does it go to the House? The House. They have a House proposal for the House and a Senate proposal for the Senate. But it would be the same proposal. No. no. The no. House Senate no. district and no. House districts. Yeah. Okay. House okay. Well, I guess my question was, who votes on this to make the these, the, the House of Representatives so goes as a report um, to the so that the House districts will go as a report to the um, House mm -hmm. only. But the legislation that actually draws the lines is a bill, and it goes through in a committee, through the House, okay. to the Senate, to a committee, to the full Senate. What committee does it go to from in the House? Government, Government operations. Government ops, okay. Yeah. And the same thing with the Senate? Yep. Yep. Do so there'll be two separate bills. There'll be a Senate bill and a House bill. Right, okay. So they could end up doing something with our Senate district, too. Right. We just don't have any... At the moment, I don't know what they're planning. Yeah, the they haven't even. But it's, a, but, it's a, but it's a but it's but it's a different. It's but it's a different apportionment board that would do no, the same no. board. The same board. Same board. But there's no role. The difference. One of the differences is there's no role for the BCAs to weigh in. Senate. It goes directly to the yeah. Senate Secretary, and they refer. That's interesting. That the same yeah. LAB does both. Mm -hmm. One we get to weigh in on, and and one we don't. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense to is me. Is that statutory or just custom? I think it's statutory. It must be statutory. It's statute. Strange. The Senate writes the statute about them, and we write the statute about <clears throat> us. Yeah, yeah. It's telling. Anybody else have comments, questions? Uh, this is Tina Beale, but that was my only question, was where is the Senate process and will there be a map published before adoption so that we have some sense, even if we don't can't weigh in as a BCA, we can at least see what they have in mind. There, there will absolutely be a map, um, and it'll, it'll be submitted to the Senate for them to work on, and then they'll do a bill, and you'll see maps. Do you think that's likely to be uh, around by town meeting? Oh, yeah. So we might yeah. have a, a kind of report for you? Yeah as part of the town meeting about where we stand on yeah. Because, of course, with the issue that, and this is Jeremy, the, the issue that Janet was speaking to earlier with the compressed time frame and needing to know which district you're going to be in, one of the notable aspects of what's going to change in the Senate is the new law that's requiring three member districts, which will affect Chittenden County. So they're going to have a similar time crunch to want to get that bill out on the floor and onto the governor to get signed so that those folks know where am I campaigning for my next Senate run. Right. I mean, it's not going to change our district. We'll still no. have three. Right. So. We'll have uh, we, I mean, we're not required to have three, but my guess is we'll have three. For Senate? Yeah. Oh, we're not required to. Mm -hmm. No, they could do singles or they could do Up one and three. two. Really? 
How does that work? You just do it. I mean, pass a bill and change it. Huh. Just like that. That's probably not that easy. Is it yes? <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Is it your intuition, Janet, that it will look like Washington County? Yes. With three at large. Yes, yes. I was trying to see. I think there will be some change. There may be some towns on the border that move in and out yeah. um, because of the numbers. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll stay at three. Any more questions on Zoom? Comments? Anybody else in the audience? I'd, I'd just like to reiterate Denise's idea that the uh, callus in East Montpelier is a perfect size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a lot, a lot in common, and uh, I really, I think that should be in the new district. So that's a, they, that is a very legitimate thing for the BCA to recommend. Is it something? Yeah, I mean, we, sh we share a lot of the same, I mean, they have obviously way more businesses than we do, but we share fire department, school, yeah. historical know, society, historical society, there's a lot of things that really? we have in common. Yeah. And the number is just about perfect. It is. Oh, it is. About 50. Yeah. Well, that would be a very reasonable thing for you to, to communicate and help. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, that's so that's one of the things that we could, when we submit some comments, we could say, you know, did you think about this? I guess we could also go back, can we go back to this Eric Covey, who's the one who sent out the original email about stuff? Do they take questions? Like, why did you guys, so did you think about this? And if you did, how come you didn't propose it? So he's ministerial, he is not mm -hmm. part of a legislative apportionment board. He's just sending stuff out on their behalf. So I wouldn't pose a question to him, but I would pose it to the board directly. Yeah, I saw, maybe report. I'll send them an email because I saw a thing where you can ask the board a question. Mm -hmm. That's fine. All right, yeah. maybe I'll send an email to them and ask them that. It'd be good to know before we meet uh, next Tuesday, you know, if this was considered and if it was, why didn't you do it? And, you know, then we can maybe comment better on it. Yeah, I don't know how quick they'd be in responding, but I'm absolutely communicate with them. Okay. Uh, Mark Garfield, yeah. uh, I'm wondering how many districts are up for reapportionment? All of them. All of them. Right. So if one <laughs> if one district says, "Oh, I want to change this," then all the dominoes fall. <laughs> it's not it's not a yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> That's how they got painted into a corner in the Huntington exactly. district, where they just sort of was like, well, that's all the ripples ended up here. This is the <laughs> district now. So, yes. is it, what is being proposed to be with East Montpelier? Is it, where is I think, it's, I think it's Middlesex. I think Middlesex. it's the existing district. Mm -hmm. which is so they could technically do Middlesex, yeah. Worcester, mm -hmm. and somebody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Benny, to the point of information, Janet, this is Tina Bielenberg again. Um, do you know whether Marshfield and Plainfield are going to be proposed to be joined as one? Mm -hmm. So the proposal um, that's out right now has them with Cabot. Mm -hmm. With Cabot, okay. Which is, which is not a bad district. Yeah, um, so. You know, there are parts of, uh, I think it's worked well, well being with them. I think it, mm -hmm. it's been good. Um, but, you know, Palace is kind of a, we're in a nice position where there are a lot of towns that we have connections with. So, um, and I think Marshfield, Plainfield, and Cabot are all in the same supervisory union. Yeah, and that makes sense. Ooh. Is there an entire map of the state online? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can I can send you a link. I can send you a link. It's, it's to the, it, yeah, the Secretary of State has a legislative portion. <laughs> that came out for this meeting. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, if, you go on to the, if you go on to the town's website and look on the left, when you get to the home page, there's a link to um, all of this stuff. Yeah. On the town's website. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Way, way more than you could. I know, way more than you ever thought you'd ever want to know. <laughs> 
there anything else or are we done? We know. It's up to you guys. Yeah. Yep. This, and thank you for letting me. No, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Nice presentation, Jeremy. Thank you for the yeah. work you put into that. Well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to have you send me your history. I will, yeah. The other thing I would say, just because you all, this is Jeremy, you guys had brought up the possibility of East Montpelier and Callis. There is a process um, that's statutory that if we wanted to meet, if our, if Calis BCA wanted to meet and have a joint meeting with East Montpelier BCA or any other possibility, mm -hmm. we could actually get one of the members of the board to come and kind of mediate as a non-voting member. Mm -hmm. if we, I saw that. So that's, that is a part so of the process as thing. well. But the time frame is so compressed. Typically, this is happening in August. Well, I have, I did talk to Bruce Johnson from Montpelier, um, and I got to check back in with him to see where their heads are at. They obviously don't like the piece being cut out on the 14th. Right. Um, right. So their BCA, I forget when he said their BCA was going to meet, but we could look at their, you know, what they thought if they post their notes online, like we will. And, and just as a reminder, the Callis BCA is accepting written submissions until the 8th. But are they sending them here? Because it, we, can, we can consider, yeah, it, yeah, we can consider, for us to consider anybody yeah. else's comments, but they can also file comments directly right. to the LAB. Yes. All I can think of is like a lab rat. I know, me too. <laughs> Good, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> All right, thank you.